lines. But check for an itch, just hmm. life to hoye gachhe. Hmm. Refresh kochin, pore dekhe nuch. Hmm. Prochondo slow as the network. I network and I act a borrow some shop. Public conum, okay. So we are ready. Good evening, everyone. This is Professor Shetani Chakraborty from Lit Infinite Journal, starting yet another guest talk session today. Today's guest is Dr. Navonita Sengupta, Assistant Professor and Head. Department of English, Sharshuna College, Kolkata. She will be speaking on From Lear to Satyajit, Translation and Linguistic Acculturation. A translator, creative writer, and scholar, Navonita Shengupta enjoys working across languages and genres. Her latest publication is A Bengali Lady in England, an English translation of a 19th century Bengali woman's travel writing. Chambal Revisited is another forthcoming translation of a contemporary Bengali nonfiction. An enthusiast of gender studies, she is also the co-editor of an anthology of critical essays on women and displacement in South Asia to be shortly published by Rutledge. Her creative and critical writings have been published in various journals and anthologies, and she has presented papers in India and abroad. Presently, Dr. Sengupta is working as an assistant professor of English at Sharshuna College, affiliated to Calcutta University, Kolkata. I now invite Dr. Sengupta to start her session. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Shritonni, and thanks to Lit and Finite uh, Journal. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this platform and to talk about a topic which is very close to my heart. It's been, uh, it's on uh, translation and uh, that to a translation of uh, the nonsense verses. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, share uh, this uh, stage with uh, Shritonvi and to talk about uh, this uh, talk about translation as uh, we see it in nonsense verses. Now, I'll uh, just share my screen. Uh, Shritoni, just let me know if you if it's visible. Uh, once yeah, the I, I shall let you know once it's visible. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yes. I hope it's visible now. Yes, I have just added it to the stream. It's visible now. Yes, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, what I'm going to talk on today is actually uh, the journey of translation, uh, the journey of nonsense verses, as we see, uh, from English to Bengal. And uh, in the process, we are going to look at uh, some of the creators of nonsense verses and how they were creating nonsense and how nonsense verse as in the uh, literature of nonsense verses and how in the process uh, of translation from uh, english to bengal uh, to bengali which we find in the case of shottajit rai what are the changes what are the ways these verses travel across culture across languages now that's a that this is an interesting journey to trace because uh, both the uh, genre of translation and the genre of uh, nonsense literature they are very new in the uh, with, within the context of literary studies it's not many years since translation studies or translated work have uh, received the 
received approval within the uh, literary academia and also nonsense verses in that sense is a new entry in that same field now uh, uh, which is why i i find this journey of uh, tracing the journey of how nonsense verse from in, uh, england travels to bengal a fascinating one now uh, the, this slide actually refers to uh, just the four well known names that we are already familiar with and to whom i'll be uh, constantly referring to throughout my uh, course of talk edward lear 1812 to 1888 lewis carroll 1832 to 1898 Shukumar Rai, 1887 to 1923, and his son, Shotajitre, 1921 to 1992. Now, uh, today's talk probably will not talk much about uh, Lewis Carroll, though we do not, uh, we cannot uh, avoid mentioning him once in, uh, once in a while when we are talking about uh, trans, uh, when we are talking about nonsense literature. But this is more about Lear and Shottajit, the two uh, names at the first and at the last. This is more about the negotiations uh, and and the the kind a kind of literary dialogue, as I would like to say, between the two. Now, um, but before I begin, I, I would like to just share with you some interesting trivia that the connection of nonsense literature in that sense with bengal does not just start with shukumara actually edward lear had visited england and uh, he had sorry visited india and he had visited uh, bengal too bengal was also in his itinerary among many other places he had been to delhi he had been to bangalore uh, now but of course uh, Unfortunately, he did not have a very uh, nice idea of uh, Calcutta, particularly. He did like the other um, uh, places. Toliganj but, uh, was a suburb at that point of time. So he did like Toliganj. In fact, he even made uh, two paintings of that place. These, uh, these are the paintings, this one and the next one. These are the paintings that Lear made of Tolliganj. So uh, um, he was he liked those areas more than uh, compared to the city itself. And he refers to Calcutta in a, a way uh, in which he calls it Hassel Fasabad, which in itself is enough to convey the kind of uh, feelings that he had for uh, the city. And he also wrote a rhyme which I have uh, just pasted here, uh, where he talks about there was an old man of Calcutta who perpetually ate bread and butter till a great bit of muffin on which he was stuffing choked that horrid old man of Calcutta. So he is actually also, uh, uh, this, this through this uh, rhyme also, he uh, brings out the fact that he was not very uh, happy or he did not like this place much now so we can say that this was the note with which bengals or particularly calcutta's association with nonsense literature or at least with the creator of nonsense verses began now uh, before i go into the uh, into a conversation of nonsense literature it is important to understand what literary nonsense or what nonsense literature means. Now, according to Jean-Jacques Lesserre, he explains that literary nonsense is an art form that both supports the myth of an informative and a communicative language and deeply subverts it by first wetting then frustrating the reader's deep-seated need for meaning. So what is literary nonsense doing is it is playing with the reader's expectation from the language. So uh, the language becomes important and what the uh, rhymester is doing here is the rhymester is creating nonsense, uh, create, uh, using language in such a way in which it actually uh, 
keeps on constantly frustrating the accepted use of language. Okay. Now, this, this constant frustration of accepted use of uh, language also gives rise to, a, uh, to certain comic elements. Okay, so now that is something which, uh, which we find in nonsense literature. Now, we look at English language, um, English nonsense literature uh, from the period of uh, Lear and uh, Lewis Carroll. But actually, if we go a, a little back also, we'll find that uh, nonsense existed in literature. For example, if we take the case of Shakespeare's Dogberry and Verges or uh, Sheridan's Mrs. Malapros. So, uh, but then again, their nonsense had a purpose. The kind of nonsense literature that we are talking about is something that became that became prevalent in the 19th century uh, with the arrival of Lear and Carroll in the literary arena. Now, there have been a lot of theorization of why they are writing this and there have been a kind of psychosexual analysis of both the authors and a number of other interpretations that uh, that we find um, like uh, literary critics and historians going uh, going into to understand why they were writing this. But uh, all those things apart, what is important is that they do not, this particular genre of literature does not follow a conventional or set pattern of logic. It does not follow any set pattern of logic, understanding or language as we understand it. And it is these uh, linguistic anomalies Anomalies are not just linguistic. There are linguistic anomalies. Then we have anomalies in terms of appearance and action, which constantly, it, it keeps on challenging the concept of normativity or what is normal within the social radar. And if you look at the Victorian society, the society in which Lear and uh, Carol was constantly creating these verses, and if you look at the social radar of the Victorian society, you can understand how this was a kind of, uh, uh, these were subverting the Victorian literary tradition. So, Therefore, nonsense literature did have a very important but subversive space within the uh, within uh, the uh, entire scope of literature. Now, this uh, there what this nonsense literature does is it's actually occupying a space between what we understand uh, as the concept of understanding and a lack of it. And the humor that we find within it is evoked largely from this liminal space where we do not find any conventional reason. At the same time, you cannot say it's completely without reason. In fact, what we can say is that it follows a pattern, a reason, a kind of uh, ideation of its own. It's, it does not submit itself to the dictates of the rational world or the literary genres, the types, the rules as we understand it. Now, in order to break through these, what it does, it uses uh, elements like absurdities, exaggerations, puns, word plays, identities, etc., etc. And of course, a very important thing that it uses is incongruous bodies. Now, this incongruous body is something that we keep on finding again and again. Okay, the incongruous body as we understand um, uh, it, it is what we do not consider as normal. So when you when you look at Lear's figures, uh, the the character sketches, you find there is a man with a long nose which is winded at uh, or knotted at its tip, or you find a person with long beard and nose in various forms actually keeps on 
coming up again and again in uh, case of uh, Leo. So that is uh, something that we have to keep in mind when we are looking at uh, nonsense literature. So basically then to come back to what Jean-Jacques Lesser says that it supports the myth of an informative and communicative language that is language is for the purpose of communication that language always transmits something meaningful now while it supports this myth because you cannot say that the words it, it is using are completely baseless meaningless so while you cannot say that at the same time it is deeply subverting the uh, reader's expectation of the language now Therefore, nonsense literature, as we understand, is occupying a space which uh, falls somewhere between an under understanding of the uh, language and beyond it. It actually, I would say rather that it goes beyond the expectation, beyond the normative understanding of a language. Now, then comes to the other part of the paper. We, I, uh, this talk is about both nonsense literature and translating of nonsense literature. So then why translate? If, if there is such a kind of a work, why do we need to translate it? Now, translation has purposes, politics, reasons behind it, which goes uh, like which can be talked about in numerous papers and classrooms. But here I, I have just picked up three very uh, like three uh, very common causes of translation. One is that we are trying to make the translate making make a translated text available in another language system, and on the other hand, we are. Uh, um, that is one thing. The other is uh, it's it's a kind of a cultural exchange. And the third is that it is introducing a new genre. Now, when we are looking at translation or adaptation of uh, nonsense literature in uh, Bengal, we are also looking at introduction of a new genre. So because before 19th century, whatever uh, was there, it, it was not in this form of translation, uh, it, not in this form of nonsense literature as we understand it. So, uh, so bringing these two together, then we arrive at a problem. We, we understand that when we are trying to uh, translate something which does not follow the rules of its own language into another completely different language we are actually inviting trouble because what is translation translation is the act of representing a text in a language system into another language system so what will translator do or or what is the act of translation uh, primarily based on it is based on finding an equivalence of this language of the source language into the target language now when we are trying to find an equivalence then of course it that equivalence will be based upon the rules of that language but we are looking at a genre which does not follow the rules of its own language on firstly secondly it includes a lot of cultural idiosyncrasies thirdly it includes a lot of words which are meaningless, uh, therefore untranslatable. Now, you can say that if it's meaningless, then what's the need to translate it? Now, what is the need to translate the meaningless word or to uh, uh, like transcreate the meaningless word is something that we will come to uh, come later in the course of discussion. So. Uh, therefore, translation, uh, that is the problem that we come at when we are looking at the problems of translating nonsense literature. So, uh, therefore, what the translator of nonsense literature has to do is to negotiate between these absences or between these subversions and find a way in which to reproduce 
this uh, reproduced the text from one culture to another. Now, whether it is possible or not remains a question. Of course, there are multiple translations of uh, Abol Tabol uh, that we find uh, present today. Uh, and uh, quite a number of them are, uh, are excellent renditions of, um, of the uh, original, Bengali original. But still, there remains a gap, as a Professor uh, Shukanto Chaudhuri himself had said while translating uh, Shokumar Rai's Abul Tabul. He has, there is a translation of a number of poems uh, from Abul Tabul by uh, Shukanto Chaudhuri, as many of us know. So uh, there he himself said that he has not been able to attempt translating all the poems. Now, Probably uh, they can be translated or they cannot be translated. What remains in question is the fact the is the problem that arises in uh, translation. Now, uh, recently, Calcutta University has included translation of uh, a translated piece of nonsense literature, which is actually Shukumara's Abol Tabol translated by Shottojit Rai and uh, published by Writer's Workshop. But as Professor Anandolal has himself said that most of these translations uh, by Shottoji are actually transcreations. He does not follow strictly the translations. Uh, he does not strictly follow the original text while he is translating. There are many places where he is divergent from the original. And it is this, uh, this nature of Shotojit that we will be looking at as well when we go into the way, uh, when we look in, at the way in which he has translated Lear for his Bengali readers. Now, um, now what I'm going to uh, briefly go into is the journey of nonsense from Edward Lear to Shotojit. Now, as I said, in the 19th and early 20th century Bengal, we find this nonsense literature flourishing. And we also have, apart from Shukumarai, uh, other uh, literary artists attempting translation. For example, we have Robindranath. We have Troilokonath Mukhopadhyay uh, and his adaptation of Alice in Wonderland, which is actually an adaptation. We cannot call it translation because it is in many ways very uh, different from what uh, Troilokon, uh, from what uh, Lewis Carroll has uh, written. Nevertheless, it is in uh, an adaptation based upon Lewis Carroll's uh, work of Alice in Wonderland. Now, but uh, the genre itself finds a proper holding when we are looking, when we have Abol Tabol by Shukumarai or the, and later the Hajoboro law. Now, as Michael Heyman says in the 10th Rasa, that Shukumar isn't the only uh, Indian nonsense poet around, uh, but there are many others, for example, Nabokanto Borua in Assamese or Mangesh Padgaonkar in Marathi. But the problem is, he, what he says is that uh, Shukumar has such a depth and breadth of nonsense that comparison outside Lear and Carol tend to diminish his accomplishments. Okay, so the, this is one of the problems that we, uh, this is uh, what actually uh, the place that Shukumar Rai occupies in um, nonsense literature in India. Now, uh, so while what we are looking at is if we look at the trajectory uh, before coming to Shottajit and his translation of uh, Lear, it is important that we do understand what Shukumar Rai has been doing because it's the same legacy that we find Shottajit Rai also following later on. So, uh, Therefore, what we are looking at is uh, Shukumar Rai is bringing in the nonsense literature in 19th century as an influence of the English uh, nonsense literature. And in order to quote Heyman again, uh, it is actually that for what which we call modern or literary nonsense in India is a hybrid product that arose from 
colonial contact. So like many other genres that we find uh, being influenced by the uh, being influenced by the English uh, literature, nonsense literature is also something that we find being highly influenced by the from the uh, by the English literature. So what is happening is uh, what is happening here is we are looking at um, a genre which has been brought to Bengal and uh, Shukumar Rai plays the pivotal role in introducing this uh, literature of Vimsi, as uh, Shatujit Rai calls it, and which is later recorded by Michael Heyman as well, that it is the tenth rasa, the uh, uh, apart from the ninth rasas that we have in Indian literature, this is the tenth rasa, which is the that of the whimsical. So this is this bringing in or importing the whimsy from uh, the uh, 19th century England or the 19th century English literature in incorporating it into Bengali literature. And uh, what Shokumar Rai did in his Abol Tabol is he created characters which are so steeped in Bengali culture that it is difficult to say uh, that he has been inspired by the Western literary tradition to create such a masterpiece. So uh, this is how we are looking at uh, the flow of nonsense from England uh, to Bengal. Now, if we look at uh, Lior Shukumar Rai and uh, Lewis Carroll, we find that all of them had created whimsical characters. But more importantly, another uh, important thing that we notice, that we locate when we look at these uh, work, uh, works uh, by all three of them is how uh, is their illustrations. There are fabulous illustr illustrations which are uh, which have been left behind by all these three of them, and they complement their work in in a, uh, in such a manner that it is today not even possible to think of Abul Tabul without the illustrations or to think of uh, Lear's rhymes without the illustrations. So somewhere we find a kind of uh, similarity um, in the way nonsense literature was presented both in Bengal as well as in uh, as well as in England, and we see the kind of characters that they have left behind. If we have Jabberwocky, uh, which is created by Carol, we have Lear's dongs and uh, jumblies and the pobble and the quangle wongle. So on the other hand, we have uh, Shukumar Rai creating Hukomukho Hangla, which is translated as the lug-headed loon or Rangoru Rechana, which is the son of the Rangaru, or Tash Goru, the blighty cow. So uh, these are all immortal characters, which of course do not find a presence in the real world, but they have been immortalized by the 10th uh, Rasa of Vimsi that we find present in these uh, verses. Now, uh, coming to what actually uh, want to uh, be the focus of today's uh, talk, which is Lear and Shotojit. Now, I did spend quite some time in the background because I felt that it is important to establish how the nonsense literature travels into Bengal uh, in order to, uh, before actually talking about Shotojit's translation of Edward Lear. Now, uh, the collection in particular that I'm going to talk about is uh, Torai Badha Ghorardim, which we, uh, which actually, if I translate it loosely, would mean a bouquet of horses' eggs. Now, uh, Ghorardim is uh, something which uh, we keep, which is a kind of idiom in uh, Bangla where uh, we say like if, if, if it means nothing and um, it, it represents actually nothing. So Ghorardim, because of course it doesn't exist. Uh, so Ghorardim in itself is a kind of a nonsense that is already existing in colloquial Bangla. 
so it's like ghora dim which which means nothing and that is how he is um that is how he is actually naming the anthology in which he includes uh, translations uh, of lear and uh, also some other uh, some other poet uh, uh, translate uh, sorry nonsense poets of his period now what is he doing what is he uh, doing when he is translating these literatures uh, these poems sorry so uh, they are of course creating a problem for him while he goes to translate because nonsense literature is extremely language as well as culture specific as i have already mentioned so what is he trying to do and what does he uh, what what is he that what is it that he is trying to achieve now there are certain negotiations that as a translator uh, translator he has to do there are certain choices that he has to make and what he chooses is to prioritize the target language reader so once he decides that his priority is the target language reader and he is not prioritizing the source language text that makes the work uh, i won't say easier but definitely gives a direction to the work that he is trying to do and once he has decided to prioritize the target language what he does is he appropriates the verses accordingly in uh, the following slides i'm going to just show how he appropriates the verses and uh, while appropriating something interesting he does like he has uh, he has uh, uh, accommodated two long poems by lear one is uh, dong with a luminous nose and other is the jumblies now in both jumblies and dong he keeps the plot if we can um, say call it a plot but whatever the uh, um, elementary plot is present in the original so he keeps that but uh, there are many changes that i'll discuss later that i'm i'm just going to discuss but in the smaller verses what he does and he says states that in his preface as well he completely uh, at places he completely changes the text he keeps the illustration which is why i talked about the illustration he keeps the illustrations and he creates the work he recreates the verses which uh, once again becomes a problem for translation studies as to how to classify it are we going to call it as a translation or are we going to call it a transcreation or an adaptation now if we just look at these see this this is a uh, look at the two pictures this is from edward lear's book of uh, nonsense verses rhymes and this is from shatujit torai badha ghorar dim and uh, what we have here is uh, this is a very popular uh, rhyme where there was an old man with a bird who said it's just as i feared two owls and a hen for larks and a wren have all built their nests in my head now in the bengali one i am not going to read out the bengali one uh, those who understand the language can of course read it but what he is doing is he is bringing in a number of cultural uh, changes like uh, for example uh he uses the word two types of there's this uh there is this uh, two owls and a hen four larks and a wren uh and he just changes the uh, order and uh he says acta moro chakte shalik so one hen a hen and hen becomes a cock here he says a moro because saying morgi that is a hen would have actually changed the meter changed the rhyme and uh, the rest actually remains the uh, same but here the rhyme is of four uh, lines here he includes one extra line and makes it of five but still this is one of the poems where uh, one of the rhymes where the difference is minimum where uh, though there are changes small changes <clears throat> both stylistic as well as in terms of meaning 
but the change at least is minimum because it's keeping the original theme intact. If we look at this one here too, we find there is a digression, but the digression is a bit more. There is like there was an old man who said, "Hush, I perceive a young man in this bush." When they said, "Is it small?" he replied, "Not at all. It is four times as big as the bush." Now this old man becomes Ganguly, and it is like shallow. Shaloke Sham Ganguly. So it's like he's giving a kind of Bengali identity to the man. But the illustration is the same. See, this is the same illustration that we find in Lear's poem as well. And he says that uh, if I just loosely translate the Bengali one, it is like this uh, Sham Ganguly. He smiles and says, I'll go and uh, pluck the flowers. But when he goes to the garden, he sees that on the flower pot, there is a now bulbuli is a singing bird if we, we can loosely probably translate it to nightingale so ram bulbuli he uses the word ram bulbuli ram is a, a kind of a prefix which is used uh, often to denote uh, something big in uh, bengal so uh, there is this uh, this last line, it is four times as big as the bush, gets translated into Ram Bulbuli. But all these elements of going to uh, pluck the flowers and going to the garden, all these are not there in the original. We find that he adds it. Shatrajit himself adds it. So we can say that he keeps the uh, illustration but changes the idea changes the verse similarly here also we find there are changes the illustration is the same and uh, while uh, it it says that uh, here there is no question of sneezing here in the bengali version we find that the the rhyme says that while he tried to sneeze there was a knot in his nose now this is completely uh, something that uh, shotojit himself has created so this is how he is trying to uh, negotiate these uh, uh, verses to bringing it for the children uh, or the young readers of Bengali language. Now, question may arise whether so much of a diversion or digression was uh, required or not. But um, at the same time, we have to remember that this, uh, what Shotajit was trying to do was his not, he does nowhere says that he is being faithful to Lear. But what he is trying to do is he's actually trying to bring the English uh, nonsense, the flavor of English nonsense for to the Bengali readers. Now, if we come to the two bigger uh, or longer poems that is in, included in this anthology, we find that there is a kind of uh, transculturation or, or an acculturation. So, Jambali has become Papangul. He, uh, the poem where uh, Jambalis are the characters, he translates them as Papangul. Uh, then their heads are green, their heads are blue, gets converted to Neel Mathate Shobuj Chul, that is green hair on, uh, on the blue head in Bangla. And uh, there are other areas where there is a problem in negotiating. For, for example, food. Food is very culture specific. So uh, instead of uh, like cheese, we find uh, while there is a use of cheese in Lear, we find Shatujit using the word dhakai uh, bakor khani. Bakor khani is a kind of flat bread, uh, which is particular of Bengal. So uh, these are some of the way, uh, ways in which he is negotiating with the culture, with the names of items that cannot be translated at all the time, keeping in mind the rhythm, the rhyme. He does not let the rhythm uh, go awry. The, the, all these rhymes are excellent in uh, rhythm. The rhythm is not, of course, the same as that of, an in, of the English always, but it is the rhythm remains. It's a consistent, constant rhythm. Now, he makes similar changes with uh, place names as well. For example, Grambulia becomes Ghumbulia. Now, Ghumbulia, uh, of course, it can be seen as bringing together of two words, ghum and bulia. Ghum means to sleep and bulia means to forget. So uh, at, again, there is a kind of meaning, uh, but at the same time, meaninglessness uh, associated with the name of the uh, places. Now, but 
Shwetaji doesn't stop at that. He also inserts certain cultural elements in it, which is particularly Indian in nature. For example, in the Jambli's translation as Papangul, what he does is he brings in the, uh, he inserts this easterlies, the mention of the eastern wind in the rhyme. In the, in the first two uh, stanzas of the rhyme, he uses this, uh, uses, uh, introduces this word of easterly. Now, there is no easterly in uh, Lear's rhymes, but he, but uh, Shatajit makes this cultural insertion. Another thing that he does, and very interestingly in uh, the poem, in the rhyme Dong uh, with the Luminous Nose, is he talks about the Dong and then he rhymes it with two very, very culture specific words, dong and shong. And they are extremely uh, culture specific if, uh, if, when we, uh, if we look at it, because a dong is in many ways, is used in many ways. It is used for coyness. It is used for, um, it is also used as a deroga derogatory uh, term. But, uh, like uh, and and shong also shong uh, can uh, uh, mean a kind of a jester or, or a clownish kind of a figure but shong also uh, in it uh, in its own uh, sense has a kind of, uh, has a, a certain derogatory nuanced association with it so uh, shotajit uses this extremely culture uh, specific words here make, making it making the complete uh, transformation or a complete adaptation of the of a foreign language text into its own culture his own cultural context now why is he doing this why do we find he is making these changes what is it that he is doing here now as i said earlier he gives importance to the target orientedness he focuses more on the understanding of the target language readers and if we look at some of the translation theories, uh, contemporary translation theories, we find if we look at the Scopus theory, we find that in that Hans Verme talked about prioritizing the purpose of translation. That why am I translating it? And with that, we find uh, uh, Shatajitra is very clear. He is translating it for Bengali readers, and that too young. Bengali readers who do not have or may not have an exposure to the Western culture or to the Western linguistic tradition. So therefore, uh, it, the, if, if we prioritize the purpose of translation here, then what Shatujit is doing is completely justified. Similarly, we have a Christian Nord also talking about the loyalty to the initiator of the uh, of the translation. That is, who is translating? That uh, or the reason of translating, which is again bringing the focus upon the target orientedness of the translation of the uh, of the uh, so the target language becomes important. Another thing that we find Shatujit is doing here is he is using domestication as opposed to foreignization. Now, if we look at uh, Venuti's uh, analysis of foreignization and domestic domestication, he uses, uh, he advocates use of foreignization in the English language text or in the European um, translation of the, or uh, particularly of uh, of the minority language text in order to uh, make the uh, may in order to break down the hegemony of english language over the other languages now shotajit if we look here he is just subverting it what he is doing is he is domestic uh, he is using the tool of domestication in order to uh, like uh, once again in order to break the hegemony of English language and complete the cultural transformation of the text of the text that he has taken under consideration and to make it completely available to the readers of his 
own language. So the concern here is to recreate the nonsense for the Bengali language readers, the Bangla readers, in the same way as Lear does for his English audience. So what Shatujit is doing is he's not looking at whether uh, he's not trying to see uh, how faithfully he can translate Lear, but what his agenda and I focus on the word agenda. What is agenda here is to bring these work closer to the readers of his language. And I repeat once again, readers who may or may not have an initiation into the Western linguistic or cultural tradition. So now if he has to achieve this, this can only be achieved, of course, by a certain amount of domestication uh, of the foreign text, certain amount of adaptations and including, including uh, certain cultural elements, replacing some cultural elements by some other cultural elements. Then we come to the questions that are these translations or adaptations? Now, Adaptation has been defined in Rutledge Encyclopedia of Translation Studies as a procedure which can be used whenever the context referred to in the original text does not exist in the culture of the translation text, thereby necessitating some form of recreation. And exactly this uh, is what Shotojit is doing here. What he is doing here is he is recreating what is not available in the uh, in his target culture no, sorry uh, yes in the in the target culture by introducing elements that belong to the target culture so that he makes it available so that he makes these rhymes better available to the uh, uh, to the readers of his linguistic belonging to his linguistic community and uh, while a reader uh, with an access to both these languages can identify these gaps but the readers those who are not initiated to the language at the same time can enjoy these poems these rhymes and get an understanding of um of these rhymes and a seamless enjoyment and i would say uh, like borrowing this term of seamless transmission from today's uh because we are all always online so he there is this seamless movement of uh the nonsense of the flavor of nonsense verses of the way nonsense verse uh, of the way he looks at nonsense verses to, for his own audience. So there is a seamless transference of enjoyment, of literary enjoyment, as well as um, understanding from the uh, source language to the target language, keeping in mind the audience or the readers for whom he is actually creating this space, for whom he is actually creating this uh, particular genre. So uh, we can therefore in many ways say that uh, by doing, by using these tools of adaptation of uh, breaking down the culture, breaking down the, mm, uh, or not going into linguistic equivalence or cultural equivalence, but instead bringing in uh, elements from the uh, source, uh, from the target language into the uh, into the text. What he is doing is he's recreating these texts definitely, but at the same time. Uh, these are also translations because by recreating them, he is bringing into uh, into the within the genre of Bengali uh, literature. He is bringing in elements that are definitely from the uh, English uh, literary, um, uh, like uh, from that belongs definitely belongs to the English literary tradition. So. Uh, Therefore, in, in many ways, when we are looking at translating or the travel of uh, nonsense from Lear 
uh, to Shatajit Rai, we find that there are many changes, there are adaptations, but at the same time, the spirit remains the same. The spirit of whimsy that Ray is so particular about, that remains the same. And therein lies the success of these texts as literary work or literary creations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shengupto. It was like uh, a kind of extremely engrossing session that we had uh, with the volley of questions that are coming in. We will just uh, take the questions, the opinions one by one, the inputs that we have. But definitely this was like a kind of new uh, way of you know putting things across and the way you have discussed uh, the known things in almost uh, in a very critical theoretical bringing in those unknown concepts and ideas uh, i hope they are going to enrich the audience to a very large extent so thank you for such an engrossing lecture that we had thank you so much i'll just thank take you. up the questions one by one okay so uh, this is one question that we have from one of our uh, audience, uh, Shuropriya Chakraborty. She is asking, are nonsense literatures mostly composed for the adults? Then what about the perspective for the children? As for example, she has talked about race poetic versions, which are acceptable for both the children and the adults. This is the question. OK. No, see, nonsense literature, if we look at its origin, if we if we think of why Lewis Carroll had uh, written Alice in Wonderland, uh, you'll uh, remember that he had written it for a young girl, for a young girl, mm -hmm. for his friend's daughter. So uh, it's that was definitely created for uh, definitely created for children and uh, even uh, Shotojit had uh, said here in the preface that he is writing for the young uh, readers of his uh, uh, of Bengal and uh, therefore it's not that it is created for adult but then definitely we adults have this uh, habit of moving into whatever comes across us and uh, it is something that is enjoyable to uh, both adult and uh, young adults and children in uh, in general so uh, therefore uh, it is we, it's a, it's see it's a literary work which can be we can say which breaks the barriers of um, maybe age age uh, and therefore is acceptable to almost everyone who's there but uh, then again if we if we think of lear's rhymes most of the lear's rhymes have remained uh, rhymes for children how many adults do actually go back to it so nonsense literature is a uh, we do call everything as nonsense literature everything that uh, falls under the spirit of whimsy, but then definitely there are categories and uh, ways in which we can differentiate. Mm, thank you so much. This is, uh, again, another uh, comment that we received uh, from one of our audiences. And he says, uh, Raj, that it's a very good initiative. Thank, thank you so you. much for your comment. And really, not just a good initiative, but we had such an enriching session by Dr. Shen Gupto. I'll just take the next uh, the next question. Uh, it's by Navamalati Nyok Chakravarti. How uh, she has just commented that she remembers how they could see through the humor of it. We enjoyed modern children just give a wry smile. Uh, one more question we are having here: Do nonsense rhyme engage the twenty first century children's attention? They are yes, more into do. other worlds of technology. No, no, yes, yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would actually uh, say this from my personal experience because I remember my son just rolling over when uh, I first narrated to him the I read out from Hojaboro Law, or or I remember the uh, the Durga Puja functions where all these children they were so excited about this Pagla Dashu and uh, these or or the kind of enjoyment they have when they are reciting Abol Tabol. So. I think if we need to initiate them in the right way, which many a times we do not as well. Uh, of course, the lure of the technology, the lure of these Power Rangers and all these things definitely there, but nonsense literature too has its own charm, I would say. 
thank you one more question we are having again by uh, shuropriya chakraborty is trans creation creating any literary challenge to the main text no i won't i won't say so because they are uh, if to remember that when we are translating they are for two different uh, culture and particularly not in this context because uh, why it is not in this context because say if we think of translation of uh, of a work like uh, shubarno lata and there we have uh, uh, trans creations then it would be definitely a problem because the idea there is of course to uh, present the text as uh, ashapurna devi conceives it and to present it but when we are looking at the uh, when we look at the translations here or if we look at the um, what do i say the uh, idea or the reason the reason why shatyajit is translating he is not translating it as a challenge to lear he is translating it merely to present the whimsy to his own readers so it they are in two very different traditions two different space and two different times so uh, one a, a bilingual person who understands both bangla and english would enjoy both torai badha ghoraddi ghoraddim as well as uh, lear's uh, right uh, lear's right. rhymes so i don't think they prove um, pose any kind of challenge uh, i think uh, along with the comments we can take one last question of course uh, this is by madhu shivastav does nonsense literature have a legacy in india before shukumar roy this is what uh, yes. i i am uh, like see around this period we have rabindranath kapchara we have troilokonath uh, this translation of alice but before 19th century even if there are uh, nonsense literature in bengal i am not very much aware of it so that's probably an area which we need to uh, look a bit more on but around this period there were other experiments as well with nonsense thank you so much dr shen gupta for such an exhilarating session that we had and uh, we already have a flurry of comments coming in if you are having more questions we can definitely channelize those to your official mail id because people are interested to know more and uh, this lecture will also be uploaded on our journal's youtube channel so we shall be sharing the link with you uh, and this is open for our readers also so before we finish uh, any uh, you know encouraging words for our journal for lit infinite how we yes, can lit infinite you know? is definitely doing a lot of good work and like as going through some of the uh, publications of lit infinite and they are excellent and but this thing that you're doing like uh, the last time also there was another lecture but another yes, resource yes. person i think that adds hmm. another dimension bringing in the auditory experience of our talk as well in in, in so fact that is what the virtual platform had created that that has created for us the virtual things uh, yeah. we can't go for a live talk sessions physically so you know these virtual meets and talk sessions we try to invite the resource person so thank you so much ma'am for such a thank wonderful you. evening and in future also we are definitely uh trying to get you for some of our sessions for some of the seminars that we are going to arrange thank you so much for coming thank you so much it was a pleasure thanks to all our audience who were there thanks for all your questions for all your lovely comments we will again be back with another talk session thank you ma'am